be with me in paradise. The greatest and most historical event of all of history was when Jesus Christ died on that cross. And when Christ died on the cross, the lightning flashed, the thunder roared, the darkness came as the nails had gone into the hands of Christ and a spear had gone into his side and the nails through his feet. And Jesus was hanging between heaven and earth, suffering for us. The soldiers had taken him out of his prison and they'd put a crimson robe on him. They'd beaten him two or three times. And then they took two or three murderers with him, two of them in particular who were going to be crucified with him. And then they took him across Jerusalem and they made each one of them bear a placard or at least a herald went before them to bear a placard telling of their crimes. And then Jesus stumbled and fell. He was weak from the loss of blood and they compelled an African to help him carry his cross. And as long as the history of man shall go, we will always remember that it was an African that helped Jesus bear his cross. There are people today that say that Christianity is the white man's religion. Don't you believe it? For all of those who believe in Jesus Christ he belongs to all people. He came from that part of the world that touches Asia, Africa, and Europe. He belongs as much to the African as he does to the European, and as much to the European as he does to the Asian. Jesus Christ belongs to all people, but an African helped him carry his cross. And then when they got to Golgotha, these soldiers went about their work, nailing the nails in. These two murderers and thieves that were being crucified with Jesus were yelling, screaming, crying. But Jesus never uttered a word. And they took some medicated wine that acted as a sedative and gave it to the two thieves and they took it and they offered it to Jesus and he refused it because he wanted to drink the very bitter dregs of death in our place for us. He wanted to suffer all of death, showing that God loved the world and God was willing to forgive the sins of the world because of what Christ was doing on that cross. The people that were watching were laughing and sneering. They said, he saved others. Why can't he save himself? Come on, you worked great miracles. Why don't you work one more? You raised Lazarus from the dead. You raised a widow's son from the dead. Why can't you save yourself? Those blind people did not realize that God had foreordained and predetermined that Jesus Christ was to die the death of the cross. And it was only through that death that the world could find forgiveness and salvation. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The Apostle Paul was an intellectual, one of the most brilliant men that ever lived. And Paul went to Corinth, pagan, intellectual, immoral Corinth, the university center of the ancient world. And Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why did Paul say that? He said that because God has locked up in the cross the secret of the universe. The only way that earth can ever find reconciliation with heaven is by way of the cross. The only way that you can ever get to heaven is by way of the cross. And if Jesus Christ had not gone to the cross, you could have never had sin forgiven. You could have never gone to heaven. And the problems of earth would have never had a solution. Only by the way of the cross 
can we find our way back to God? And that's why it was important that Jesus stay on the cross. Because you see, man is in rebellion against God. Adam and Eve rebelled in the Garden of Eden. And every man since Adam and Eve has broken God's law and sinned against God. And as a result of that, God and man are separated. And man's only way back to God is through Jesus Christ. Man had broken the law. Man deserved death. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. But God said, wait a minute. I'll give my son. I'll let him die. I'll let him take the judgment and the hell for you. And if you will put your trust and your faith in my son, I will forgive your sin. I will change your life. I will give you an inner peace and joy and satisfaction that you would never find in any other way. So Jesus was dying on that cross for your sin and your sin. Some people say, why don't you try to make your gospel relevant? The most relevant message in the world tonight is the fact that Christ died for you. He died in your place. He shed his blood for you. And without that experience, no one can get to heaven. Yes, Jesus Christ died, and the people laughed and sneered. And two people that sneered and laughed the most were these two thieves and murderers that were dying with him. They were both mocking him, but one of them became strangely silent. And finally, this one that was silent turned and rebuked the other thief in the air of the murderer and said, we're dying justly. We deserve to be crucified but not this man in the middle. He's a good man. He's the son of God. Then he turned to him and asked him what seemed to be an improbable, an impossible question. He said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Will you remember me, Lord? And then Jesus gave one of the most astounding answers in the history of the world. The angels in heaven must have been shaken and startled and amazed when they heard what Jesus answered. Jesus said, Today, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Think of it. Here was a thief, a murderer, a man that had committed every crime in the book, dying, turns to Jesus in his dying moment and says, Lord, remember me. He didn't even say, forgive me. He didn't even say, Lord, take me to heaven with you. He didn't say, Lord, prefer me. He just said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus answered quick as a flash and said, today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. And to all of you people that think you can't be converted in a moment and that you cannot be saved at this hour and at this moment in this rain in Baton Rouge and have your whole life transformed, you read the stories of the New Testament and the encounters that people had with Jesus. There are many of you that came here tonight in this rain that never dreamed that you were going to meet Jesus. You came out of curiosity or you came because your bus was already on the way or you had already promised some friends to come or you're a student here at the university and you came out of curiosity. Many of the people of the New Testament that came to Jesus never planned it. They never thought that they would have their lives changed. This thief on the cross that had been in prison knew that he was going to die on a cross. He knew he deserved it. He never dreamed that before the night came, that day, he would be in heaven. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. 
I'm going to see that man in heaven someday by the grace of God. He wasn't saved by his good works. He didn't even have time to be baptized. He didn't have time for anything. But he's in heaven. That's the grace and the mercy of God. And I want to tell you that the greatest word in all the language of men is forgiveness. That day, Jesus forgave him of every sin he had ever committed, wiped the slate clean, and he was in heaven. There are three things about this passage. The whole gospel is in it. There's repentance. It's the only deathbed repentance in the whole Bible. I don't know what led this fellow to ask that question or to make that statement. It might have been the prayer that Jesus had just prayed, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. It might have been what Jesus had said to John concerning his mother. I don't know what it is or what it was, but the Holy Spirit used it. The Holy Spirit used it to convict him and to convince him that he needed Jesus and he repented of his sins at that moment and he was saved. I can imagine the other thief saying, why, what have you done? Have you turned preacher or something? You remember we strangled that old merchant for his gold? Remember you kidnapped that little child? Remember that girl you raped? Remember that person you slew? You think God's going to forgive you? Are you turn a preacher? He can't forgive you. I don't care what your sin is. I don't care how deep in sin you've gone. I don't care what you've done. God can forgive you. God can cleanse you. God can make you a new person tonight if you put your faith and your trust in him. Yes, he repented. And the second thing he did was to believe. The Bible says if we believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. The scripture says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Just repent and believe, and then you'll be saved. He said, when thou comest into thy kingdom, as though he were thinking of some far off kingdom age somewhere. And Jesus answered and said, today, right now, you'll be saved. Right now, you can have eternal life. You can put your trust and your confidence in Christ now. And he did. And that day, he went to paradise. Now, it's the word remember that I want you to think about a moment. He said, Lord, remember me. Did you know that God forgets? Did you know that there's a scripture in Jeremiah 31, 34 that says, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more? God can forget. God can forget your sins. What does God forget? God never forgets the universe. He sends the rain. Yes, sir. God sends the rain. But the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun comes upon the just and the unjust. God blesses all of us with all of his blessings. He never forgets. Suppose he forgot the sun rain. Suppose the sun ceased to shine. The earth would turn into a glacier. Suppose God would forget because the scripture says that God holds the whole universe together. And if God ever took his hand off, it would blow to pieces. And then the scripture says that God remembers you. Tonight, I had in my little office here where I see people, a lady and her children and a mother and their son and their husband is a prisoner in North Vietnam. I don't think any of us will ever know what these families have suffered. I don't think any of us will ever know what those boys out there have probably gone through psychologically and physically, never knowing. And then we had another one come and see us tonight, and her husband, she's just found out, is a 
is alive and a prisoner, but for a long time she didn't know he was only missing an action. But let me tell you this, God remembers them. And when we bowed our heads in the little office and prayed that God would remember them and that his grace and his love would reach out to North Vietnam to the prison camp and touch them, God remembers them and God answers prayer. How many times has God been with you? You don't even know. Because you see, you almost had a wreck the other day. But you were saved from it. Why? When you get to heaven, you may find out why. It might have been divine intervention. And that happens to all of us. God remembers you. And then God never forgets our sins either. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. The Bible says, God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The Bible says, for God shall bring every work into judgment. God is going to judge every sin that's ever been committed. What is your sin that so easily besets you? It's going to be brought to light, all the secret things. God is going to judge it. God never forgets sin. No sin has ever been forgotten by God. God has recorded everything you've ever done and all the things you've ever thought from the time you were born till the time you died. It's all there. It's all in the record book, and God will never forget. Nothing is going to be forgotten. How do you stand before God? But there's one thing God can forget. He can forget sin because of Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He hath made him to be sin for us. It says in Isaiah 53, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. It says in 1 Peter 2, 24, Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree. The scripture teaches that God can forget our sins because of Christ. The sin that would damn us, the sin that would send us to judgment, the sin that would send us to hell, God can forget. In Hebrews 1, 3, it says your sins are purged. In Isaiah 43, it says your sins are blotted out. In Psalm 103, it says your sins are put away. Isaiah 38 says your sins are put behind his back. And in Hebrews, it says God can remember your sin no more. Ladies and gentlemen, because Christ died, because he rose again, because of what he did, God cannot remember my sins. I've committed plenty of sin in my life. And even if I'd only committed one sin in my whole life, it's enough to cause me to go to the judgment and be lost because I could keep the whole law and yet offend in one point and I'd be guilty of all. But God has forgotten my sin. He forgot every sin that I have ever committed. Everyone he has forgotten. He's the only person in the whole universe that can forget. He has the ability to forget. Has he forgotten your sin? Have you brought your sin and laid it at the feet of Jesus? What a night to give your life to Christ. You may never have another moment like this. The Bible says, He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. You've sat here for over two hours in the rain. Many of you are soaked all the way through. And you've done it because you want your sins forgiven, many of you, and others of you have sat here because you're praying for somebody that needs Christ. And this is your hour and your moment, and it may never come again like this. I'm going to ask you to do something that I saw people in London do. I saw people in San Diego do. I saw people in Pittsburgh do. I'm going to ask scores of you to get up out of your seat right now and come across this field in the rain and stand here and by coming say, I want Christ in my life. I want my sin forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to know that I will not be at the judgment in that final day. I want my life transformed by the power of Christ. 
I'm going to ask you to come right now. Men, women, young people. God has spoken to you. You need Christ. And in a moment like this, you'll never forget it. I met a missionary out in the Far East a few months ago. Said, I received Christ one of those nights at Wembley Stadium in the pouring rain in England and stood ankle deep in mud to find Christ. And said, I thank God because if it hadn't been for the rain, I don't know whether I would have come that night or not. But he said there was something about the challenge of coming forward in the rain that challenged me and it changed my life. Yes, it's not easy to come, but Christ went to the cross for you. And many people are on the way now. You get up and come and make your commitment to Christ. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. to all of you that have come. You've come tonight to make your commitment to Christ because you want your sins forgiven. You want to know you're going to heaven. You want a new direction in your life. And you've come to make a commitment to Christ because you want him to forget your sins and save your soul. Well, I want to tell you, he remembers you and he loves you and he wants to forgive you. He loves you. Keep that in mind now that God loves you and is willing to forgive and forget all the past. And from tonight on, there are four things that are very important. First, read your Bible every day. We're going to give you a Gospel of John. We want you to read it several times before you read any other part of the Bible. We're going to give you a Bible study. We're going to give you some verses of Scripture to learn, memorize. This helps you to grow. Desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, the scripture says. You cannot grow in the Christian life without reading and studying the scriptures every day. Secondly, pray. God will hear and answer your prayer. You're his child now. He loves you. Take every detail to God in prayer. He will answer your prayer. Don't let a day go by but what you spend a few minutes every morning, every evening, and all during the day in prayer and pray about everything whatever the details are nothing is too small to bring to god's attention and then thirdly witness for christ how do you witness you witness by the smile on your face you witness by the new attitude you have in the dormitory the new attitude you have toward work the new attitude you have in the home and then you witness by going to somebody of another race and going out of your way to be kind and courteous and gracious. And people will soon say, well, what's happened to you, Mary? And you can say, well, I've found Christ. He's changed my life. That's witnessing. And then fourthly, get into a church where Christ is preached and get to work for Christ. Get into the church and work in the church. You say, but I don't like to go to church. Jesus went to the churches of his day and they weren't all they were supposed to be. But he did it to set us an example that we should go to church. Four things, read the Bible, pray, witness, and go to church. Now I'm going to ask that we bow our heads and I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. Oh God, I am a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to turn from my sin. I receive Christ as Savior. I confess him as Lord. From this moment on, I want to follow him and serve him in the fellowship of his church. In Christ's name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. 
there'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classic. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the 102nd Psalm, the 102nd Psalm, and a very strange verse in a way, the 5th through the 6th the and 7th verses. I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. This week, President Reagan in his news conference declared to the world, you can look pessimistically on the world today or you can look optimistically. He said, I chose the optimistic look. And tonight I want to speak on why I am an optimist. And in this passage of scripture, an interesting little story surrounds it. In 1954, we were in England and we were holding a crusade that lasted three months at uh, the Harringay Arena in London, England. And my wife is a bookworm and she loves to go to old bookstores and buy old books and just browse through old books. And she has hundreds of them that she's gotten over the years, some of the great classics. And on this occasion, she saw a little old man in there. Well, he wasn't an old man, about a middle-aged man. And he was very discouraged and very despondent looking. And he came up to her and said, Are you Mrs. Billy Graham? And she said, yes, I am. He said, well, you know, he said, I'm so discouraged. He said, my marriage is breaking up. And he said, everything is happening to me. I don't know what I'm going to do. And she said, well, why don't you come out to the Harringay Arena tonight and hear the gospel? And she gave him some tickets that she had in her bag. And she didn't see him again. Wondered what had happened to him. Prayed for him. One year later, we were back in that same city, of London holding a crusade at Wembley Stadium where incidentally it poured rain every night in the open air like this except on the last night and it was clear and ice cold. So we had a delightful time in the rain and in the cold. But an average of 60,000 people every night came and on that last day I remember we had 90,000 people in that cold air. But anyway, she went to that same bookstore. She was browsing around and this same man came and he was bright and chipper. And Ruth said, I've never seen such happiness on the face of anybody. And he said, you know, I took the tickets. I went to the arena that night. I accepted Christ as my Savior. My wife accepted Christ. Said, now we have a Christian family. And he said, you know the verse of Scripture that your husband quoted that night that won me to the Lord? He said it was a hundred and second psalm and he got a Bible and he showed her. I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I watch and am a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Now, I never thought of that as being an evangelistic verse. But it was to him because he said that described my condition. Because he said I felt like a pelican in the wilderness. A pelican doesn't belong in the wilderness. He belongs down at Galveston or someplace. I'm like an owl of the desert. Well, owls don't go to the desert much. And he said, that's the way I felt that night. And he said, it changed my life. Now, the whole world tonight is like a pelican, an owl or a sparrow. Dickens wrote of the French Revolution in 1775 that it was the best and the worst of times, and that's what we're seeing today. 
Glamour Damocles in the 4th century BC said something against the king of Syracuse and he was ordered to sit under a naked sword suspended by a single hair. Now there's a difference between an optimist and a pessimist. And I heard about uh, one of our prisons. Two convicts were looking out of a cell window one night and the pessimist saw only the bars. But the optimist saw the stars. Yesterday, we read of a 31-year-old son of one of America's most wealthy and influential families, you'd know his name if I called it, who left America for India with this resolve. Here's what he said, quoted in the press. I renounce capitalism. I renounce communism. I come to India to settle here permanently to have the grace of the Supreme God. And with this, he assumed a brand new name, forgetting his past, becoming a new name, hoping that there somewhere at the feet of a guru, he'll find the answer. One night we were leaving India about three years ago and we went to the New Delhi airport. We had been up in the northeastern part of India preaching up in the mountains. And at the Delhi airport, it was jammed with American students. They were lying all over the place, university students. And I said, who are these people? They said there are three 747s coming to pick them up. They've been here studying at the feet of some guru and they're going back disillusioned. Young people searching for something, anything to find peace and happiness in a world that seems to have gone mad and insane. Nothing seems to make sense to some of our young people anymore. And then they read about some of their heroes. Well, I can remember 15 years ago and 20 years ago, people went absolutely wild over Elvis Presley. And now the trial has just finished and we've read all in the press about how terribly he had gotten in his latter days on drugs and how these drugs probably contributed to his early death. And many of the people that are your heroes and many of the people that you think are at the top are really in their hearts at the bottom. Searching. They don't find it in all this popularity. They don't find it in all the adulation. They don't find it in all the popularity. They don't find it in money. They don't find it in some other philosophy. But they can find it in Jesus Christ. And so can you. There's a telephone number there on your screen right now. If you will pick up your phone and call that number, a counselor is standing by to say a word to you. You can find the answer in the person of Jesus Christ. Many of you here tonight have an unfulfilled longing in your soul. A New York taxi driver about, oh, it's been a year ago now, I suppose, asked me if there was anything to cheer about where I came from. And I said, certainly there's many things to cheer about. And I thought about at least four times, Jesus said, be of good cheer. The first time Jesus said it was to a paralytic. He said, son, be of good cheer. Your sins have forgiven you. Now this man was sick of palsy, but Jesus knew that he had deeper needs. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus said, a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. There's something deeper in your life that you need that materialism cannot satisfy. Money cannot satisfy. Pleasure cannot satisfy. And one of the things that you need is the forgiveness of sin because all of us have sinned against God. And the word sin means lawbreaker. You are a breaker of the laws of God and so am I. And the Bible says that you have, if you have broken in one point, you have broken all of God's laws. So we are breakers of all of God's laws and there is a penalty for breaking the law of God and that penalty is death and destruction and judgment and hell. That's the penalty. And we're all under sentence. We're like Damocles sitting under that naked sword. We're already under condemnation. We're not going to be condemned when we die. We're condemned now. We're already under condemnation. And Jesus came to save us from that condemnation and from the penalty of that sin. Be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You see, man is trapped by sin. We're in a trap. Very much like a rat that's been captured in a trap. 
A featured film in Houston this week is The First Deadly Sin. And the first deadly sin was committed by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when they rebelled against God and broke God's laws and you and I inherited the same tendency to sin. It went to Cain and Abel and Cain killed his brother. He became jealous. He became filled with pride. And he killed his brother. Murder took place right in just outside the Garden of Eden. And it's still taking place all over the world. And then not only that, but we suffer spiritual death and eternal death. And that means that when your body dies, your soul, the spirit that lives in your body, goes out into eternity away from God, lost. And that's why it's so important for you to repent of sin and turn to Christ while you can. We're trapped in sin. We saw today the account of a 54-year-old who beat up his 91-year-old mother to get money. He got $1,200. Then from the torture of his guilt, he committed suicide. The Bible, thank God, assures wonderful forgiveness for all sin. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are for covered. God can forgive you because of the cross. Because on the cross, Jesus Christ died for our sins. And because he was willing to die, God can now forgive you and remain just. You see, God had a problem. How could God forgive the sinner and remain just and holy and righteous? Because if God had come along and patted us on the back and said, you're forgiven, he would have been a liar. And if God had been a liar, he would have not been God. Somebody had to pay the penalty. You and I are guilty. Who's going to pay the penalty? Jesus paid it. That's the reason he came. We sing that song, Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. That's the reason the word blood is used in Scripture because the word blood stands for life. He gave his life for us on the cross. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And it's wonderful to know that all your sins are covered by the blood of Christ. Yes, God can forgive sin because of the cross. And if you'd like forgiveness tonight and to know that you're forgiven, you that are watching by television, pick up that telephone now and call the number on your screen and be sure. You know, the United States Air Force I read recently was trying to locate a major who was lost in flight and it cost $10 million to search for that one man. But God gave far more than that for each of us. The Los Angeles writer Alice Ramirez wrote in her syndicated column this week, in this year of the handicapped, she spent a day in a wheelchair as an assumed paraplegic. It gave her a whole new perspective of what it means to be handicapped. You know, one time I went several hours with a blindfold around me just to see what it would be to be blind. It gives you a whole new perspective on what it means to be handicapped. But you see, God in Christ came down and became a man. He became handicapped in a man's body. The mighty God of heaven went into a man's body, as it were. And just like us, only without sin, and finally died on the cross, and when he died, he became guilty of our sins. He'd never told a lie. He'd never committed adultery. He'd never had lust. He'd never been jealous. And yet he became guilty of all of it because he had your sins on him. And when they put the spikes in his hands and the spear in his side and the blood gushed forth and he suffered and the angels of heaven came, were ready to come to rescue him, he said, no, forgive them. I, they know not what they do. And he's saying tonight, I'll forgive you if you'll come to me in repentance and faith. In 1 Peter, Peter says in the 18th verse of the first chapter, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We were redeemed, not with silver and gold. And all the gold in the world can't save your soul. You can give all your money to charity. You can give all your money to the church, but that won't save you. You can work all you, the rest of your life in good works, but that won't save you. You can join every church in town, but that won't save you. 
You must repent of your sins and receive Christ by faith. For by grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You can't work your way. It's grace, and the word grace means unmerited favor, something you don't deserve. God gives it to you as a gift, something you can't buy, you can't work for. It's a gift, and God offers you the gift, but you have to reach out and receive it. And the Bible teaches that this world system is dominated by evil. Satanic, cosmic principles of force and greed and selfishness and ambition and pleasure seem to be in control most of the time. And the world system is very powerful. It is often outwardly religious and scientific and cultured and elegant. But underneath is seething with rivalries and ambitions and lust and hate and greed and jealousies. That's the world. And Jesus said, that world will not like you because you're following me. It hated me, it'll hate you. And often this world of evil is upheld in a time of crisis only by armed force. I don't mean everybody in the world is evil. I'm talking about the sins of the world, the evils of the world dominated by the devil. But Jesus met the world with all of its evil. He met the devil. He met the flesh which means the evil principle within us. And he conquered. He conquered death, which is the last great enemy of mankind. And by the cross, we are crucified to the world. In other words, because Jesus died on the cross, the world system with all of its power has been crucified as far as we're concerned. It has no longer power over us. Sin shall no longer dominate us. Sin no longer reigns over us. We may fail in sin, but the moment we do, we'll be convicted by the Holy Spirit and we get up and confess our sins and He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But Christ has disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them triumphing over them, the Bible says. Our authority over the world is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have authority, I have power. So do you, an ordinary believer, over the evils of the world. And so let the temptations come. Let the devil try to get you off track. And you have a power there with you. That's the reason we try to get you into the Scriptures and get you studying the Word of God and memorizing Scripture because when Jesus met the devil, he didn't argue with the devil, he didn't debate the devil. He quoted scripture. He said, it is written three times and three times the devil was defeated. The tempter is going to come. But you have a power in the word of God and you have a power in the Holy Spirit living within to help you as you meet the temptations and troubles and trials of this world. Yes, I'm an optimist. I believe that I can overcome the world because of Christ. I'm not afraid of all the sins and the evils and the lusts and the temptations around me. I can walk straight in the midst of this world. It doesn't mean that I get out of the world. I have to live every day in the world. And those temptations are there. But I have a power to say no. So do you have a power to say no. The same power that's available to all of us in Jesus Christ. And then lastly, the coming again of Christ. He said, be of good cheer, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Yes, Jesus Christ is coming back again. He's going to set up His kingdom and he's going to reign forever and ever and ever, and the kingdom of God is going to triumph. No ideology existing today is going to last. None. Only Christ will last as King of kings and Lord of lords, and he will come back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to be punished with everlasting destruction. But when he, come, he, when he comes, he shall be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you 
was believed. In that day, you'll find that little phrase used everywhere. That day, in that day, in that day, the last days or the day. It's used all the way through. That is the day of his return. I go to bed every night with the hope that Christ is coming. No, this world is not going to blow up in some great atomic war. The human race is not going to be totally destroyed. God has other plans. He has a plan that Christ is going to be on the throne and Christ is going to rule and evil will be destroyed. The devil will be cast into hell and the demons will be in, cast into hell. There is going to be universal joy. There is going to be universal peace. There is going to be universal justice. And the scripture says that you and I have to make a choice. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. Elijah said, why halt you between two opinions? Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. Jesus said, enter in at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go therein. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. He said in that seventh chapter of Matthew that there are two gates. He said there are two trees. He likened life to a tree. One produces good fruit and one a bad fruit. You are like a tree. He said there are two foundations. One is built upon the sand and when the wind comes, it blows away and the other is built upon the rock and it lasts. Which is yours? You must choose. You say, well, Billy, what do I have to do? First, you have to repent of your sin. The word repent means that you're willing to change your way of living. You say, oh God, I am a sinner. I'm sorry. I'm willing to change my way of living. And then by simple childlike faith, like a little child trusts his father and mother, you trust in Jesus alone for your salvation. And then you're willing to follow him and serve him, whatever the cost. If you have a doubt that you know Christ tonight, I'm going to ask you to do something we've seen hundreds and several thousand people already do this week. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now, hundreds of you, and come down on this field and say tonight, I want to know that I have eternal life. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want Christ to have all of me tonight. And I'm ready to pay whatever price he calls upon. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. And why do I ask you to come? Because every person Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. And he said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. He died on the cross publicly for you. People sneering and laughing at him. But he hung there for you. Now he says, you come publicly and declare yourself for me. The Bible warns that his spirit will not always strive with us. You may never be this close to the kingdom of God again. This is your one moment. You better take advantage of it. When will we ever see this in Houston again? Never in this generation, most likely. You get up and come and make your declaration for Christ tonight and receive him into your heart and let him come and change your whole way of living. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. And after you've come here, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature. You can go back and join your friends. Just that simple decision that means everything in eternity. You come. We're going to wait. Quickly, men, women, young people, come over here, all around. And up in that top stand up there, it takes an extra minute. So start now. Don't let anything keep you from Christ. You come. Bring your friend with you. Immediately call again and again and again. They'll be there all evening if you can't get through right now. And make that commitment that these people are making here. And be sure and go to church next Sunday. Across the nation tonight, Trained counselors are standing by at several counseling centers ready to take your call. If the line is busy, just wait a few moments and then call again. They will be standing by as long as the calls keep coming in. Until then, Cliff Barrows here for Mr. Graham and all the team saying good night and may God richly bless you.
If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank